Hi everybody, Joey here again and welcome back. So in today's video, I'm going to show you something that I like to call the internal aquarium sump. However, it's truly inspired by the corner matten filter. If you're not familiar with what one of those are, essentially they are just sponge that is held securely in place in the corners with pieces of glass or acrylic, whatever your tank is made out of. We've actually made a regular matten filter in the past, so if you're not familiar with what one of these are, I suggest you probably watch that first. You could even say that this is simply a supercharged corner matten filter. The supplies are actually quite minimal. You'll need some silicone, you'll need some one inch filter foam, and you'll also need a bucket. The taller, the better. For tools, you will need a simple razor blade and a drill. Other tools and things that you might see in this video are entirely optional, but all you really need are these two tools. To start out, you need to cut the bottom off your bucket. Now you can do this with a razor blade, but to save time, I simply used my table saw. With the bottom cut off, we can now size it to our aquarium. You want to place the bucket on top of your aquarium and kind of gauge how much of a wedge you're going to need. Basically, you want to keep in mind that you need to accommodate a pump and heaters or anything else you really want to put behind this. Then cut it. Now you could use power tools to do this, but again, a simple razor blade will cut a bucket. With the wedge cut out, you'll notice that there's also a lip to the bucket and you'll need to cut that off. Personally, I like to use a combination of wire cutters and a razor blade. However, a razor blade will do it all. It just takes a little bit of elbow grease. Now you're left with a perfectly formed wedge. The thing about these buckets though is that they are limited to their height. So if you have an aquarium taller than your wedge, you're going to need to do something about it. Since you have so much bucket left over, you could take another little piece of it and create your wedge to be as long as you want. Simply silicone them together. If that's the case, wait 24 hours and then move on to this next step. The next step is drilling holes into the wedge. You'll want the holes to be about six millimeters in diameter. You'll also want to drill as many as you can to allow as much flow through this as possible. Now the big problem with buckets is that they come in a limited amount of colors. If you're lucky you'll find the color you want but a lot of the times you'll be stuck with a white bucket and white tends not to work with most aquariums. So what your next step can be and what you should consider doing is sanding it down and then spraying it with Krylon Fusion for plastic. I suggest using a matte finish so it blends into the aquarium more. This way you get whatever color you want. Now according to Krylon, their paint is 100% non-toxic once it cures. However, you do need to give it a full seven days to entirely cure. The only thing they don't do is rate it for underwater use, which means it could potentially chip off over time. So that's why we sand it first. So you definitely want to make sure you sand it to allow the paint a better surface to stick to. Once you've allowed the paint to dry, you can go ahead and silicone it in place in your aquarium. Now, mind you, this doesn't have to be a corner filter. We put it in the corner because it requires a small wedge and taking up a corner is the least obstructive in the aquarium. With that said, if you make a bigger wedge, you can place this wherever you want to, including a side or back wall. That's what I really like about this filter. It's not only entirely customizable to where you want to put it, how big it will be, what color it will be, but it's also very low costing. Plus you can hide all of your equipment behind it from pumps to heaters. And that's why I call it an internal sump because you can literally hide all of your equipment inside it, which is one of the big benefits to having a sump. Once everything is cured, you can go ahead and now install the filter foam. Now, before we move forward though, there's a couple of things I'd like to know. First is you'll notice that the height of my wedge is about an inch below the rim of the tank. The reason being is simple. If all of these holes happen to clog, which obviously they probably never will, but if they ever did, water can still freely flow over this wedge. We still need the foam to come up to the top of the tank so fish can't actually get behind it. The size of your foam actually needs to be slightly bigger than this wedge just so it fits in nice and snug. Now you have to decide on what you're going to run this with, whether it's going to be a water pump or it's going to be an air pump. Air pumps would definitely be the most economical and you could just build an airlift to move the water like I actually showed in the last video where we built a sponge filter like this. I'm choosing to go with a pump simply because you can get more power out of a pump. An airlift would be great for a lot of the smaller tanks, but for you guys that want to do this on bigger tanks, definitely use a water pump or something like a power head. Now when installing, you have a couple of options and really it's going to come up to you. 
you either put your return through the wedge or you go over it. Totally up to you. I prefer to go through it for a more uniform look. If you go through, you just have to drill a hole wherever you want your return to go. Whether that's at the bottom or the top. You could even run a T or a split in your return pump and have some of the output here and some at the bottom to get total circulation. Or you could just simply run a hose over the top. How you do it's going to depend largely on the type of pump you have and they're all going to vary based on their connections, but for the most part it shouldn't be difficult to attach a hose to any type of pump. As you can see, going through it looks pretty good. If I needed to divert the flow or more control over the direction of the flow, I can just attach a small elbow to this or a 45 degree elbow and direct the flow wherever I want. I also suggest having the outputs the same color as the wedge or weir here simply because they will look a lot better being the same color. Now before we fill this tank up and I explain how this works, let's talk about sizing these filters and flow rates first. Now like I said, if you're using an airlift pump, those are great for smaller tanks, and I mean up to three feet long. When you get into the bigger tanks that are four feet and six feet long, you definitely want to go with a pump because you can control the flow and get a lot more flow out of those pumps. Aim for about four to six times per hour circulation of your overall water volume. So if you had, say, a 50 gallon tank, you'd be looking for two to 300 gallons per hour for the pump. But when you get up to the four and six foot lengths, you can't just have one of these. You're going to need two of these, one in each corner which means you'll have two pumps and you can split that gallons per hour between the two. Or you could even run them a little higher. A lot of it's going to depend on the density of your stocking as well as the fish you're keeping. Some fish like a little bit more flow, some don't. But since we have so many holes drilled through this, the gallons per hour is not really going to have a massive impact on how efficient this will be as the water is going to be really evenly distributed over a large area. Now for the width of the foam, you can go as wide as you want really, but use a minimum of about eight inches of width. This will ensure you can get a pump behind there as well as your heaters or anything else you want to put back there. And it allows you to have a sufficient amount of foam to perform its job both mechanically and biologically. Okay, now let's fill this up and see it in action and then I'll explain how this really works. Now that it's filled with water and the pump is running, you can see that it's obviously doing its job. What I did was actually point the output slightly upward so I can get lots of surface agitation, which will break up the surface and any proteins that collect on it, as well as increase the surface area, which will aid in oxygen exchange. Now the way this works is based on water displacement. As water is pumped from behind the sponge, it's forced to go to the front. As the front rises, it creates pressure against that sponge and all the holes and, it and the water has to flow back through to equalize itself. That's basically how one of these work. Now as the water is flowing through that sponge, it's both mechanically filtered, which means it's filtering out all the particles and visible debris within the water, as well as performing biological duties because beneficial bacteria is now living within the sponge. So not only does the sponge perform mechanical duties, but it also performs biological duties. Sponge filters like this, in a sense, are one of the most simplest man-made filters you could have. Now even though the pump is back here, we could still install other things like a heater, for example, or other types of media if you want to have some carbon back there, or whatever the case might be. And obviously there's absolutely nothing else within the aquarium. Now to maintain something like this, you would simply unplug your pump, disconnect the pump itself and the output, pull the sponge out, rinse it off in some tank water while you're doing a water change, and simply put it back in and connect the pump once again. And then simply plug your pump back in. Now since maintenance is so easy on this filter, you might as well do it every time you do a water change. However, even that is not necessary. Typically you'll need to rinse the sponge every couple of weeks, depending on how messy your fish are, really. The number one telltale sign that you have not done enough maintenance is the fact that the water levels are no longer equal in the back. Meaning that the water level in the pump chamber is more than an inch lower than what's in the tank itself. At that point, you know too many holes are clogged and you've waited too long. Now, what about some pros and cons to this filter? Well, the number one thing is its simplicity. It's very easy to run and take care of. Plus, it does a really good job, especially if you use a pump. The second thing that I like about doing this method of corner mat and filter is the fact that when you remove the sponge to clean it, everything stays in place behind it. 
as opposed to just using a sponge and then some braces along the side, which is the original design. You can get substrate or fish can get back there or equipment is exposed and so forth. You can also keep some really bosterous and aggressive fish with this. There's no way they're getting through this panel. It's also a really good type of filter for almost any aquarium. For example, you could use this in quarantine tanks, you could use it in hospital tanks, you could use it in grow out tanks, you can obviously use it in fry tanks because fry aren't going to get sucked through that sponge. You can use it in breeding tanks due to the fact that a lot of the suction is diffused through so many holes and obviously any other type of aquarium you'd like that would benefit from having a sponge filter on it like this one. It's also really cheap to build. I'll be honest and tell you that I used a bucket that I've had for a few years. It was old and banged up. I decided to cut it up for this one. But you can buy a bucket from Walmart, for example, for like four bucks. And you can build no less than three of these out of each bucket. So I guess if I were to have bought this bucket and built three of these, each one would have cost me less than $1.50. The only other thing that I need to worry about is the sponge and the pump. Now you can buy a really cheap pump for like 15, 20 bucks on Amazon, eBay, your local pet store, or online, anywhere really. All you have to do is look around. And then the sponge itself. Now that sponge I got on eBay for 15 bucks. I cut it down into three pieces so I could use it on three different filters. So really I'm only using about $5 of sponge here. So each one of these filters in total, including the pump, the bucket, and the sponge is costing me about $25 on average. Obviously costs are going to vary based on how you do it though. And that's the beauty of this filter is that there's so many configurations that you could go with and then you can customize it to whatever you need it to do. The only con that I personally don't like is that you actually have to drain your tank completely to get one of these installed. But with that said, many of you are willing to do that and or are considering setting up a new tank. Personally, if I were to set up a big fish room, this is exactly the filter that I would use. So if you've made it this far, do-it-yourself aquarium filters is obviously something of interest to you. It's something you really want to get into. I will admit that filtration is one of my favorite, if not the favorite aspect of the aquarium hobby. Besides the fish, obviously. I can say with certainty though that the chapter on filtration in my book, The Ultimate Do-It-Yourself Handbook, for the Do-It-Yourself Aquarius is absolutely my favorite chapter. The reason being is simple. I really go in depth about filtration, including talking about the bacteria itself and understanding it, knowing what it needs and what you have to do to facilitate its growth. Obviously I talk about the types of filtration and the media for them and how much media is really needed. Giving mathematical equations so you can literally calculate how much media you need based on the stocking and fish you're actually keeping. Sizing your filters and various flow rates based on the method of filtration as well as the type of filter you're using is also gone in depth about. And then obviously I show you how to build a bunch of different types of filters as well. If you want to get a copy you can go to thekingofdiy.com where it's available in ebook as well as soft cover version. Your purchase goes directly to supporting content just like this. Anyways, I hope that you guys enjoyed today's video. I also wanted to thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next Sunday for a new do-it-yourself project.